Hi, my name is Ronnie Fulton and I've been installing crown molding for 25 years and today I'm going to show you how to get it done like a pro. The first step in installing molding is locating the wall studs for attaching the molding into and I like to use a rare earth magnet that basically finds the the uh, drywall screws or nails in the drywall and it locates them for you. Once you locate one, a good rule of thumb is every 16 inches there will be another stud and you also always have a stud on every corner. So I go around and I like to use green tape and mark those locations first. Now that we have put tape on every stud location, the next step is to identify our layout. And one of the most important things with layout are corners. And you have inside corners and outside corners. An inside corner would be a corner like this, and an outside corner would be a corner like this. When doing a room that has outside corners, I always like to do the outside corners first. And the main reason is the outside corners are the showpiece of crown molding. They have to be dead on, and that's what makes a professional looking installation. One of the first mistakes that a lot of people make when doing crown molding is assuming that outside corners and inside corners are perfect 90 degree angles. And because of the drywall or plaster processes where they build up the corners, they never, almost never are 90. They're usually 88 or 92 degrees. So you would want something to measure. Something as simple as this will actually get the measurement for you. I like to use this, uh, it's a digital one, but anything will work, but you wanna go around next and identify what the angles are of all the corners in the room. So perfect example, the angle for this outside corner is 94 degrees. Inside corners are a lot more forgiving when you cope the moldings. And I'm gonna show you how to do that a little bit later. But coping the moldings gives you a way to adjust the angle slightly, as opposed to an outside corner that has to be exact. So we'll go into that in a minute. So crown molding detail, generally the smaller ridge is the bottom and the smooth long is the top. This is four and a quarter inch molding. It's a good size for starting out. I wouldn't advise going any bigger than that on your first projects because any mistakes are magnified the wider the molding gets. A miter saw is a must. If you don't have one, you can always rent one. Uh, another must is a taller fence because I'm going to show you how to cut it on the actual fence and not on the flat. Cutting on the flat is referring to cutting a double compound miter on the fence. It's a lot easier to cut it actually standing in the place. So here is a very important part of cutting on the miter saw. You always flip the molding around to the other side. And this represents the wall and this represents the ceiling. So knowing that this side is the wall and this side is the ceiling, all the measurements of the room are going to be taken and marked on this part of the molding. So this is where we start getting measurements of the room. For this outcropping right here, we have eight and five eighths. And then I can measure across here. And we are at 61 and a quarter. Writing them on the wall really helps because if you forget it, the saw, you can always come back and look on the wall. So for the fireplace, the dimensions I have is eight five eighths and eight and three quarters on the side and then 61 and a quarter across the face. And the most important thing that we need to know is that this is an outside corner and this one's an outside corner. And this one will be what I'll call a, a butt cut where it goes up against the wall. And so we've got butt cut, outside corner, outside corner, butt cut. Okay, this part might need to be watched a couple of times to get the concept. I think it's one of the more complicated parts of understanding how crown molding is, is cut on the miter saw. But first tip I'll give you is that you wanna bring the molding down to where it's flat, dead flat on the back face, just like it's gonna be sitting on the wall. And one tip is you can take a pencil and you can actually mark on your saw where that is. Also, when you're, you haven't been doing this for a while, like I have, you can also attach a board across that acts as a guide. You can do one on each side so that when you set it up, it'll go right to its spot. I've been doing it long enough that I just usually just put a line and I can hold it while I cut it. Um, that's the other tip. And then let's go on next to how to know which way to cut the, the molding. So if we look at our cutting sheet, 
we have on the front of the fireplace 61 and a quarter inches across the face and that's what we're going to cut first with a 94 degree angle on each side and those are outside cuts so i've set my saw to 47 degrees which is half of 94 and i've made my first cut i made my first cut and that's what I'm gonna to measure to because this represents the right side of the fireplace. You're always cutting upside down. So this is the right side and the next cut we make will be the left side. So I'll take my tape measure and the place that we wanna to measure to is right there because that represents the corner that's gonna wrap around. So I take my tape measure and I put it on here and we're gonna be at 61 and a quarter so I put that right there and I go over here. Sixty-one and a quarter. And I put a mark right there, and that's gonna represent my other cut line. And I think I moved a little bit. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Now the next step that I'm gonna do is I'm going to do another outside corner. And the way that I, whoa, got molding away. The way that I determine which angle to do it, the cut on, is I want it to grow. Since these are outside corners, outside corners always grow bigger than your measurement. That's the best way to think about it. They always grow bigger than your measurement. So I'm going to put this on here. two outside corners. Another way you can tell an outside corner that you did it right is you cannot see the face of the wood when you look at an outside corner straight on. An inside corner, you see the face of the wood when you cut it. Outside corners are pointed and you cannot see. This concept is not easy. It takes a little while, a lot of practice, it takes a lot of cuts. This is cuts from four rooms, so you get practice really quickly. Um, but when I first started, I would mess up a lot of molding, made a lot of mistakes, and that happens. One of the things you can do to save yourself from making mistakes is you can actually take a couple of cuts and you can keep them at your saw and you can actually label this inside cut and you can label this one outside cut. And you can kind of check before you make your cuts and make sure that you've got it right. And that saves a lot of molding to do that. But once you do it for a while, you don't mess up that much. Okay, next we're gonna do the left side piece of the fireplace and I have eight and five eighths, also at 94 degrees. So that's gonna be a 47 degree cut. So I'm gonna always start on these little short pieces with the outside miter. And I'm gonna make sure I'm on 47. It saw automatically locks into 45, but you have to actually dial in 47. And I'm just gonna start with the outside cut and I don't even worry about the measurement right now. <laughs> So this gives us our first point to measure to. This represents the outside corner like before. And we've got eight and five eighths. So I'm gonna put this on here. And I'm gonna mark eight and five eighths from that corner right there. And so on the inside corner, we actually can cope, which I'll show in a minute. So we can just cut a flat piece for this side. So this represents where it comes back to the wall and we have the outside corner. So now we're going to do the right hand side and then we'll take it over to the bench and we're going to pre-make it on the bench before we raise it up into position. Crown molding jobs are defined by the outside corners. It really draws the eye. So I always try to make sure that I have those dead on. One of the easiest ways to make the outside corners look great is to actually build them on a bench and not on the actual wall because the wall is not perfectly straight and the corners sometimes want to slide. So as you can see on the bench, if I put an L shape, if you put a square or something on a bench, you can easily bring a miter together and make it look really nice. So what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to pre-build these on the bench. 
So I like to use CA glue on the miter joints and Instant Cure. And it allows you, you put Instant Cure on one side and you put the CA glue on the other and you can bring them together. And in just a few seconds, it creates a bond. And then as added strength, I like to use a pin nailer, which a pin nailer shoots a headless pin. And the pin nailer is your secret weapon for keeping the molding together while you assemble it. Next step is sliding this into place and making sure it fits and it looks like it does. Next step is attaching it and ideally you want to use a finish nailer. Apparently mine decided not to work today. So I'm using a brad nailer, which is fine. Just have to turn it sideways. A finish nailer has the uh, magazine of the nails like this so you can come straight on. So I just turn it sideways, remembering where we marked before. And I just shoot a nail on that flat part everywhere there's a stud. The next wall we're going to tackle is an inside to inside corner. And those are a little bit easier than the outside corners. I always like to get the outside corners out of the way. So let's go over to the saw. I'm going to get the measurement and we'll cut one of those. So this represents the room that we're working in. We just tackled this area right here. And next I'm going to skip over to this wall and work my way around so that the last pieces I'll be putting in is this piece and this piece. Um, this one right here, I'm going to do a, what I call a butt cut right here. It's just me a flat cut. And then this room is actually longer than the molding that I have. I have 12 foot and it's 14 or so feet long. So we're actually going to have a seam right here. So all I need to worry about on this one is cutting the butt cut that goes against the wall here and then doing a scarf joint right here. Here at the saw, we have the butt cut and this is upside down. So this represents the right hand side of the wall, even though it's on the left hand side, because we're always thinking upside down. So I don't have to do anything with this because this is going up against the wall. But what I'm going to do for my joint, I'm going to come down, I'm going to cut what we call a scarf joint. And it's basically an overlapping joint. I like to do them at 22 and a half degrees. And I like to have my disc collector hose on. So create a mess. And I'm just going to create that cut. And it doesn't really matter about the dimension because I'm just going to have to cut an extra two or three foot piece to get me to the other side. And what this joint will allow us to do is when we line it up on the wall, when I do the other piece, this, instead of it being just a, a, a butt cut in the middle of the wall, this gives you a little bit of overlapping. Also allows you to put a screw in it at an angle. I'll show that in a minute. So another thing to keep in mind when installing molding is this face right here is the only part that sits up against the wall and then it spans up to the ceiling. So whenever I install molding, I always put it up against the wall first and then I push it up to the ceiling and I ignore places where the wall, the ceiling is crooked. This house that I'm working in is over a hundred years old and it has even more regular places than a new house. But that doesn't go to say that new houses have just as much crooked walls and ceilings and it's, it's always the case. So what you want to do is push it up, but make sure you don't go any more than flat. You don't want to make the molding go up like this. You don't want it to be too flat. So I always start with that edge and I get up, I get one in there. And I just start working my way across. problem is if you let your molding slide up too much or slide down, when you get to the other side, the miters won't align because one's sitting up and the other one's sitting down. And the most important part of a really good looking trim job are these lines need to line up all the way around. Caulk can do a lot of things, but it can't fix these points lining up side to side. Okay, now we're to the remaining piece to get to this wall. And I just need to get the measurement on this. And from the corner over, we are at 27 and 7 eighths. And I could have done, uh, used 16 foot long boards to uh, make this 14 foot span, but 
16 foot boards are kind of a pain and a hassle to deal with. I even have to get a different trailer to bring them. So I usually like to use 12 foot boards because the seams are virtually invisible anyway. So the saw is still set at 22 and a half degrees for my scarf joint that I made earlier. So I can go up now on the saw and make the cut, which I just did. Um, this will match up perfectly with that seam on the wall. So now all I have to do is measure from this point right here that represents that joint back to the corner. Okay, here's the piece we just cut with a 22 and a half degree angle. And you can see that that you can make that virtually invisible and then you can put nails through here and I also like to put a little bit of glue on there before I do it to keep the seam tight. I really like to use the tight bond quick and thick glue because it is thick and it doesn't run off when you're using it. And then I like to put this on here. I'm just gonna wipe that off with my finger. that into place and we'll go on to the next piece okay here's the next step if you can master this you will have molding down and that is coping a piece and coping basically represents taking off the back side of the molding so it can go into the flat area and that's what we we're talking about inside corners and coping and what's nice about coping is it will allow for angles that are not 45 that are slightly off but it also allows for seasonal movement. It doesn't open like an inside miter would open and shut with seasonal movement. And I think it'll be better for you just to see this, but stay with me. I'm gonna try to explain this one. And this is one that takes practice. Okay, the first step to doing a cope is to cut an inside miter cut, which means that it's going less than the actual dimension of the piece. We also know it's an inside miter cut because you can see the face of the grain when you lay it down. If it was an outside cut, it would actually, you don't see the grain. That's a good way to always remember. The next step is to go over to the bench and we're gonna actually remove all of the wood grain that you can see. Okay, before I show the demonstration of coping, let me make one point clear. What we're trying to do is basically simulate if I was to push this magically into this and it would die perfectly into the side, that's what we're gonna do with this. That's what coping is. Come over here to the bench. So to perform this melting magic, I need to remove all of this right here so that it will allow a piece to fit into that profile. There's two ways to do this. One, the manual way is to use a scroll saw and you can actually go along by hand and cut along this line right here. Cut right along that line. Um, I like to use a jigsaw with a long blade. Um, I definitely would advise doing this at first until you're used to it, but this actually saves a lot of time and this is the way that I do it. This is a Collins coping foot. It gives me a flat base to put it put against the bottom of the molding. And I'll just show you how to do that. purposely cut a back angle on it because when it sets you can't cut a perfect 
parallel, like perpendicular cut because the way that it sets, so I'll try to show you the back side here. This is always hard to do upside down. This represents the molding when it's in place. You see how it's a perfect 90 right there? But if you look at the back side, you have to cut it at an angle or it will get in the way of how it sits at an angle. And the general rule of thumb is the tighter, the tighter the angle, the more you have to back cut it. The more gradual and sloping it is, you don't have to cut as much. So whenever I get to a really uh, sharp corner, I always cut back as, as tight as I can. And that's even when you're using the um, scroll saw, you have to really cut back on it. And another tip is that you can go just off the line and come back with a file and actually file it more. And you can use a test piece to kind of see if you're, if you're close when you first start doing it. But you can tell how it's gonna sit without even bringing up the molding. But this is a big technique in molding. If you can master coping, you can make a job look great. And there's enough up there now that I can start moving my ladder. I always make a point to show how you can do molding by yourself. You don't really need any help. It's just mainly about getting a three feet and then the rest will hold. I just always make sure I push up to the wall with this being flat. And I don't worry about small cracks because I'll be taken care of later on. The bottom part where it meets the wall, that gets cut off at a 90 degree angle. I still use this point as my measuring point for a cope, but this part actually disappears. And what that allows for is for it to sit on the face of the other side of the molding. So a lot of times people wonder what to do with that. You actually cut that off. We're nearing the end of this molding installation and we have two pieces left. We have this one and that one. And on that, we have what I call a double coat. Both sides will have to be coped to meet the butt ends that come in. So I'll get ready to get the measurements on that. And what I do is I measure from wall to wall. Take that back to the bench. I'm going to cut a 53 and 3 quarters inside cut on each side. Come back to the bench and then cope it. This double cope went up with no problems and now it's on to the final one. And after I show you how to put this one up, I am going to show you how to make it look perfect. The next important step in making a crown molding job look amazing is caulk. And I like to use paintable caulk. Make sure you do not get silicone caulk because paint does not stick to it and it is a disaster. And I'm gonna show you my method to make moldings look perfect. And when I say look perfect, if you look on this, even this house is 100 years old, which is pretty impressive, fairly flat, but this is what you see in a new or old house. There's gaps where it meets the wall and there's gaps where it meets the ceiling. And what you want to avoid doing, especially on large, is not to push the molding tight up against the ceiling or the wall because your eye will see that molding wave. You want the molding to be as flat as possible. Caulk the voids, keep the molding as flat as possible, especially on the ceiling. You don't ever see the places where you caulk against the ceiling. The start to an amazing caulking crown molding job is the actual cutting of the tip. And what I always try to do is I cut it at an angle and I cut it pretty close to what the width of the bead that I want to come out. It's gotta be kind of at that angle, let's say like a little bit less than a 45 degree angle at an angle so that when you're holding the caulk gun, it can be your friend. Okay, we also have uh, some shop towels. You can use paper towels. I used about three or four and I wet them to the point of that you could actually squeeze it and water would come out of it. And I make sure I have my fingers wet and I basically just take my angle that I, uh, that I put on there and I just start following that angle. And my goal is to make the caulk go exactly where I want it to be so that my finger 
does not have to reposition it. And you just can slow down and speed up based on what happens. And then I do the same thing for where it meets the ceiling. I just go along, go nice and steady. You can go slower, faster as you get used to it. And then after I do a section that I can reach on the ladder, I make sure my finger's wet and I just pull it along and it gives a perfect seam where you cannot even see where the ceiling starts and rolling ends. Do the same thing here. Just like that. All the caulking is done and the cracks have been eliminated between the wall and the ceiling. Next up is a final paint job and this one will be done. Be sure to like and subscribe for more tutorials coming up and be sure to follow me on Instagram, Multiple Movers.